When I was relatively young, my mom lost control of her car when it hit a patch of ice two days before Christmas. Her car spun off the road, her seat collapsed, and she experienced a traumatic brain injury. She survived, but she never recovered, even to the point of recognizing my sister and me again. She required full-time care for the rest of her life. My dad is a good man. He devotedly stayed home for 25 years rather than work so that he could care for my mom at home rather than commit her to an institution. My dad is a good man who has struggled with his use of alcohol for his entire adult life. At times it was in the background of our lives, but at other times it was quite severe. He's almost 80 years old now and he has never received any treatment. It breaks my heart but it's not that surprising. I expect that many of you have similar stories about family and friends who have not received the mental health care that they need. We have a mental health crisis, and it's a crisis of unmet high need because our delivery of mental health care is deeply flawed. In 2019, more than half of the 52 million Americans with an active mental illness did not receive any treatment, more than half. And for those suffering with a substance use disorder like my dad, it was worse still. Nine out of 10 without treatment. And these are not just upsetting statistics, they are real people. One of them was Victor Kittleson, the kind-hearted and sentimental brother of one of my graduate students who died from an opioid overdose this past summer. Our failure to treat is even more troubling for vulnerable groups. Black and Latinx adults receive mental health care services at only half the rate of whites. And similar mental health care disparities exist for people living in rural communities and those with lower incomes. Access, acceptability, and availability. These are the factors that undermine our mental health care system. While caring for my mom at home, my dad's access to treatment was limited by its high cost without health insurance through a job. But geography also impacts access. For example, consider the access to treatment for the farmer in rural Kansas, when more than 90% of psychiatrists and psychologists and 80% of social workers work exclusively in metropolitan areas and predominantly on the coasts. But even if my dad had had access to treatment, it likely wouldn't have been acceptable to him. Like many men of his generation, asking for help from others and sharing his personal problems wasn't his strong suit. But even our family never discussed it. It was the elephant in the room. Making ourselves vulnerable to therapists and to each other is hard. And it's harder still because of the stigma that surrounds mental illness even today. Mental health care services often aren't available when we need them most. Many well-regarded therapists have long wait lists that can delay the start of treatment for months. And once we make it off that wait list, Treatment typically involves weekly, monthly, or less frequent appointments with a therapist. But our mental health care needs aren't limited to these pre-scheduled appointments. Would a therapist have been available to my dad at his moments of greatest need, when he lost his job due to downsizing, or shortly after my mom's accident, or on the many dark mornings when he woke with his hand shaking and had to decide if he was going to drink again to steady them? Access, acceptability, and availability. These are the factors that are undermining the treatment capacity of our mental health care system and leaving millions without the treatment that they need. Fortunately, digital therapeutics, and in particular, digital therapeutics delivered on smartphones and made smarter still by personal sensing technologies, are now emerging to target these very same three issues. But I want to pause for a moment. I want to be very clear on one point. I do not believe or hope that digital therapeutics will replace human therapists. We are always going to need therapists for what they do uniquely well. We simply need more than they can provide alone, and digital therapeutics can provide that more. So what are digital therapeutics? Digital therapeutics are software programs or apps that are designed to prevent, manage, or treat disease, including mental illness. 
digital therapeutics are delivered to patients on their smartphones. And this is the key to both their accessibility and availability. Today, 85% of adults in the US own smartphones. And equally important, ownership is similarly high regardless of race, ethnicity, income, or geography. Most of us now carry these pocket-sized, powerful computers around with us everywhere we go. And it's this widespread use of smartphones that allows digital therapeutics to provide support 24 hours a day, seven days a week, every day of the year, regardless of where we live. Some of the best examples of digital therapeutics have been developed to target substance use disorders. These apps can provide multiple supports to patients during their treatment and recovery. For example, if you need formal treatment, the apps have you covered. They include cognitive behavioral therapy and mindfulness-based relapse prevention. If you need peer support, the apps include discussion forums with other patients. The apps can also help you locate self-help groups in your community, like AA and NA. You can track your symptoms over time. You can even share your symptoms with your therapist if you opt to do so through the built-in clinician dashboard. And these are just a few examples of the many supports that can be provided to patients using a digital therapeutic. But of course, all of this would be meaningless if digital therapeutics were not effective, but they are. For example, patients with a substance use disorder have almost double the odds of being abstinent from alcohol or other drugs when they use a digital therapeutic. And these increases in abstinence are observed not only when compared to patients on wait lists who have yet to gain treatment, gain access to treatment, but also when digital therapeutics are added on top of traditional treatments for substance use disorders. And these benefits are durable. They've been documented for up to 12 months after the start of treatment. This is a big deal. The magnitude of these benefits are meaningful, even if we think about only a single patient using the app. But their true power is in their scale. When the benefits are multiplied because these apps are provided simultaneously to millions of patients in need at relatively low cost. Okay. Let's call the apps that I've been describing to you so far the beta version of digital therapeutics. Their power comes from easy 24-7 access to their many supports, their treatments, tools, and services. But this is also their Achilles heel. As a patient using these apps, you now have to tackle difficult questions like, when should I use them? For how long? Which of the many supports are best for me? And which are best for me right now at this moment in time? My research team became interested in these issues when my colleague, Dave Gustafson, the developer of a leading digital therapeutic for substance use disorders, approached us with a simple question. He asked, could you predict not only who was at greatest risk for relapse, but precisely when that relapse would occur and how best to intervene to prevent it? Dave had just completed a large study demonstrating the effectiveness of his app but he had also noticed that among those patients who still did relapse, many of them hadn't used his app in the days leading up to that relapse. And others hadn't used the specific supports within the app that he thought would be most effective for them. Dave believed that the app would be more beneficial if it, was, if it knew the person well enough to recognize when they were at risk for relapse. And if the app was smart enough to recommend the specific supports within the app that would be most effective to prevent that relapse. And I agree with him. The next wave of digital therapeutics must learn to know us better as people, not just as patients with the same crude diagnosis and the same treatment needs at all times. And these apps will do this through the use of built-in artificial intelligence algorithms powered by personal sensing. Now, you may not have heard the term personal sensing before, but you have almost certainly seen it in action. I'm a running nut. And for me, ads about trail running shoes, the latest running backpacks, the newest, fanciest water bottles seem to follow me around everywhere I go. This fall, while preparing for TEDx, I've been bombarded for books, ads, and courses to improve my public speaking. Currently, <laughs> personal sensing uses our personal data to target ads at us to sell us things but we hope to empower people to use personal sensing to improve their mental health care instead. 
personal sensing has been supercharged by smartphones. We use our smartphones to make phone calls and text messages. We frequently access and post to our social media accounts using our smartphones. Smartphone embedded sensors know our moment by moment location and activity level. Sensors can even detect other people, or at least their smartphones, in our immediate environment. Personal sensing passively captures all of this information and more to understand our recent experiences, preferences, and behaviors. It can be used to predict how we feel right now and even how we may feel and behave in the future. Let's take a look at two of the more revealing sensing methods that my laboratory is developing to give you an intuition for how this all works. Behind me is a wide view of my moment by moment location, detected by a digital therapeutic app over the course of a month when we were first experimenting with this sensing method. The app recorded the paths that I traveled with movement by car in green and running in blue. The red dots indicate places that I stopped for at least a few minutes. And although not displayed on this map, the app knows the days and exact times that I was at each of these locations. The app can immediately see that I'm a runner, with long runs leaving from downtown Madison and frequent trail runs on the weekends in the county and state parks to the west and northwest. Zooming into the Madison Isthmus, the app can see that I drive my children halfway around the lake each morning to their elementary school. And the app could detect those stressful mornings when getting my young kids dressed and fed didn't go as planned, and we were late, sometimes very late, getting to school. The app recorded my daily running commutes to and from the office through downtown Madison. And from this, it can observe my long days at the office and those days that I skipped out. Looking at the red dots, the app can detect the restaurants, bars, and coffee shops where I eat, drink, and socialize. It can use public map data to identify these places and to make inferences about what I do there. The app also collected my smartphone communications logs and even the content of my text messages. And no such luck, I don't plan to show you my actual text messages. But imagine what it learned about me from the patterns of my communications, who I was talking to, when I made those calls, even the content of the messages that I sent and received. The app can improve its predictions about us even further by identifying the specific people and places that make us happy or sad or stressed, those we perceive support our mental health, and those who undermine it. It can gather this information quickly by asking us a few key questions about the people and places it sees us interact with frequently over the first couple of months that we use the app. For example, if my dad had been using this app, it would see that he calls and texts frequently with his close friend, Ed. My dad would report that Ed has been a lifelong source of stability and support. Given this, the app would know my dad is doing well when he spends time at Ed's house, when they call and text each other to plan activities, when they go for daily walks along the beach by the Long Island Sound. The app could also detect when time spent with Ed abruptly stops each fall because Ed spends his winters in Florida. These months are harder for my dad and he would benefit from more support. The app could encourage him to reach out to other supportive family and friends during these months. He could be provided with meeting times and locations of support groups in his community. He could even be assisted to build community within the discussion forums of the app itself. And if the app knew my dad well enough, it might even recommend which of these forms of support would be best for my dad. If my dad had also been receiving traditional mental health care, he might have given permission for the app to share information with his therapist. His therapist could then increase their support of my dad during those months when he was isolated but direct their support preferentially to other patients when my dad was stable and supported by his healthy family and friends. In our research studies, our personal sensing algorithms can already predict with relatively high accuracy if someone in recovery will relapse back to drinking tomorrow based on personal sensing of their recent past experiences and behaviors. This is exciting, this is a good start, but these were preliminary research studies and the patients were mostly white and from our local Madison community. Personal sensing algorithms trained on these participants would be unlikely to work well with black or brown patients or patients from rural communities. Personal sensing algorithms must be trained on diverse samples of patients or the use of these algorithms might exacerbate rather than diminish existing mental health care disparities. I also suspect that at some point, probably about five minutes ago, you thought, 
Holy crap, this is really sensitive information that these apps would collect about me. Who will have access to it and what will they do with it? We're all too familiar with the recent privacy violations like the Cambridge Analytica scandal or the Pegasus spyware scandal. Given this, you might be surprised to hear me say that I'm generally optimistic that we'll get these privacy issues resolved, at least narrowly in the context of digital therapeutic apps. I'm not making any promises for other apps on your phone or God forbid Facebook, you're, you're on your own there. But here's why I'm optimistic. In the last five years, the FDA has recognized both the benefits and risks posed by digital therapeutics. And in response, the FDA has begun to regulate software, including smartphone apps, as it does other medical devices, if the purpose of that software is to prevent, manage, or treat disease. This means that the FDA now evaluates both the effectiveness and the risks, including privacy risks, of digital therapeutics before clearing them for use with patients. This is a big deal. These policy changes mean that, they've, that digital therapeutics are now situated squarely among healthcare, where privacy protections have been considered paramount. Digital therapeutics are here today. The FDA has already cleared the first two digital therapeutics for use with patients with substance use disorders. Our nation's VA medical centers have developed digital therapeutics to treat other mental illness. And the VA is sharing their apps for free with everyone, not just veterans, through their VA mobile healthcare website. If you need more care than you're receiving now, download and try these apps. But remember, that the beta versions of digital therapeutics that are available today are still improving. But as they become smarter through personal sensing, better mental health care is within our reach. Smart digital therapeutics can deliver the right treatments at the right time, every time, and for all of us. My dad did not receive the mental health care that he needed. Neither did Victor Kittleson. I hope that with smart digital therapeutics, we can tell a different story about you and your family and friends.